Hi, this is Morgan Somerville, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy Regional Director. My name is Meryl Harrell. I'm the Executive Director of the Southern Appalachian Wilderness Stewards. Hey everyone, and thanks for joining. My name is Dave Casey, and I'm the District Ranger on the Pisgah. My name is Clay Wooldridge. I'm the Director of the Cradle of Forestry with Find Outdoors. Uh, we were so sad to hear that we weren't going to be able to host the Wilderness Skills Institute at our campus this year. Some of us and many more would have been gathering at the Cradle of Forestry for the 10th Annual Wilderness Skills Institute to learn and work shoulder to shoulder in part for wilderness, traditional skills, and trails. We're not able to do that this year and keep everyone safe. So even though you're not on the Pisgah National Forest physically, I consider it the home of Wilderness Skills Institute. So welcome to the Pisgah virtually. Things look a little different this year. One thing is you probably won't get rained on. But we are really thrilled to be able to offer these six sessions virtually. We hope that you share learning that you have freely and openly. As a former wilderness instructor myself, I know how important the community is to be able to come together and meet new people and to learn new skills and to see all those old faces that are out there doing the same kind of work that you're doing. And so I strongly encourage you just to take every opportunity you can uh, during this time to, to focus on cultivating those relationships. Because the community created around WSI is one of its greatest values. And we hope that this will help build our community of stewards so that we come through this time of challenge even stronger and more committed than ever before. Thanks again. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the Wilderness Skills Institute. 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 And welcome to the Wilderness Skills Institute. Hi, I'm Morgan Somerville, uh, Regional Director for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, and I'll be leading the workshop this afternoon. Um, this is going to, it seems like a lot of you are pretty experienced judging from the ones I know who are on here. This is aimed at a sort of a basic level, but um, hopefully um, you will ask plenty of questions and we can get into more advanced stuff if you are so inclined. Anyhow, um, look forward to speaking with you and I guess we'll get started. Is it ready to go, Stephen? Yeah, go nuts. Feel free to continue to, a stream of uh, comments or anything along, um, and I will uh, bring them to Morgan's attention as uh, they are necessary in the moment, or I will wait. But uh, yeah, feel free to just continue to add some questions in there. But so yeah, take it away, Morgan. Yep, looking good. All righty. Well, as we just said in the opening, this is the 10th anniversary of the Wilderness Skills Institute, and the Appalachian Trail Conservancy is proud to be a partner with and Forest Service and thank you all for attending and we look forward to more years to come. I did want to acknowledge uh, some of you have been attending other of these WSI virtual sessions and uh, Jeff Marion gave one on visitor use management last week and he's been a great source of information and research for Appalachian Trail management and um, maintenance and so um, he has, as, as many of you saw, lots of slideshows, and he's shared some of those with me, and some of his uh, graphics are particularly useful, so I want to acknowledge that I will be using some of his graphics as we go along. And this, while it isn't exactly maintenance, um, it's important to realize that some maintenance problems are directly related to uh, trail design issues. And um, the Appalachian Trail, for instance, um, was originally laid out and contig contiguous from one end to the other in only 15 years. And that involved a lot of sections of trail that followed the ridge crest and were um, simply brushed a little bit and blazed. And there wasn't much trail construction actually involved. And that you know, it was okay for a number of years, but in, in the 70s when um, trail use began to pick up significantly, many sections of the trail began to fall apart because they were located on the fall line. So sometimes, uh, well, as it says here, the biggest factor to influence long-term trail maintenance is trail design. We're not going to talk about trail design much, but I want you to be aware of that. So here's a good illustration of that. The photo on the left shows a 
trail that goes straight up a hill. And the photo on the bottom right shows one that cuts across the hill on the contour. And you can see the difference in the uh, sustainability of the two trails. Jeff refers to this as the alignment angle and uh, a low alignment angle, meaning it's close to the fall line is bad and a big alignment angle, which is close to the trail being perpendicular to the fall line is much better and creates little erosion. And uh, as you can see, uh, the closer you are, you are to the fall line, the more likely the trail is to erode. And um, his research proves that. So that's one of the things that's useful. Some of that stuff is second nature to those of us who have worked on trails a lot, but it's nice when the research backs up our um, observations. And again, with uh, trail grade, um, it's important to realize that the steeper the trail is, uh, the more likely it is to erode. And uh, also the flatter the trail is, the more difficult it can be to drain the trail. So those are two things to keep in mind as you're trying to figure out how to deal with maintenance. So on the Appalachian Trail, we have some pretty uh, thorough um, traditional information about why we do what we do. We have, uh, you know, the AT has been around for nearly 100 years, and um, we have specific reasons that come through the uh, National Trail System Act, through the Comprehensive Plan for the AT, and for, through local management plans as to why we're trying to maintain the trails. But I'm curious, um, perhaps some of you would be willing to share in the chat box uh, why you think we need to maintain trails, and in particular, wilderness trails, since that's the main subject of our discussion here. Wilderness and trails are inextricably linked. Um, uh, while I and many, many people love to go cross country in wilderness um, and elsewhere, um, trails are an important way to get people into wilderness. And so um, in terms of the AT, we think that designated wilderness is probably the best protection we can get for the Appalachian Trail. So it's very important to us. There's about, uh, you can correct me, Stephen, if I'm wrong. I can never remember whether it's 25 or 26 wilderness areas along the Appalachian Trail and a couple of other places that are managed as wilderness. And in, in Georgia, about half of the uh, AT in Georgia is in federally designated wilderness. So it's a very important to the Appalachian Trail community to know how to work within wilderness and keep the AT maintained um, in terms of wilderness specifics. Um, using the minimum tool is uh, an important foundational thing. Uh, motorized equipment is generally not allowed and um, learning any agency specific trail maintenance guidelines from the wilderness in which you're working are important. For instance, in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, uh, most of the AT is in an area managed as wilderness, but it is managed differently than wilderness areas on national forests. So Smoky Mountains Hiking Club, for instance, needs to know what the difference in the ways that they may do it, uh, their trail maintenance are in one place versus the other. On the Appalachian Trail, we use, uh, we have a series of books or booklets that are called our stewardship series. The two that are specific to trail work are the Appalachian Trail Feed Book, Field Book, and Appalachian Trail Design, Construction, and Maintenance. Field book is uh, not unlike the USDA Trail Maintenance and Construction Notebook, which we also use. And uh, it's designed to be a small pocket thing that you can take out for reference when you're out in the field. And then Appalachian Trail Design, Construction and Maintenance is a uh, full size book that it goes into much more detail on a variety of trail maintenance and construction and design aspects. Uh, of course, there are lots of other books out there. Um, the American Trails has a resource library. The link to that is at the bottom of this slide. And um, virtually every trail organization that I am familiar with has their own guidance on uh, trail work. But 
you know, the basic things that we'll talk about today are all covered in pretty much the same way because uh, trail maintenance basics are basics. So I'd also be interested to know if um, in the chat, if you all have any uh, suggestions for trail um, resources that you particularly like that we could share with the group. So before you can go out on the on the trail to do volunteer work um, or well volunteer work, this wouldn't apply to our pro crews or your pro crews, but um, it's very important to have a volunteer service agreement. And uh, that is a agreement between either individuals or groups and their agency partner and it specifies what can and can't be done in the volunteer work. Um, the benefit provides to volunteers is that it, it covers you for injuries, uh, immunity from liability. Um, the federal government will um, act as your defender in case uh, you're taken to court for something you built and that caused a problem. And protection from claims for damage to or loss of personal property incident to service. Um, And so it's, it's about safety for the volunteers. It's so that there's a procedure in place so that the volunteers that go out on work trips know um, how to operate uh, appropriately. And in wilderness, um, it allows the agencies to provide specific guidance on how they would like their wilderness area maintenance to occur. And uh, technically, if anyone is out doing work on a federal property without using a VSA, then uh, it's illegal. So uh, the volunteer in the forest and volunteer in the forest programs are part of the VSA. Um, and um, they provide protection for the workers that are signed up and using proper um, personal protective equipment. Um, it does only apply when you're on the job, not driving to or from the work trip. And something that not everyone knows is, but if you do have an accident, and we hope you don't, that the injury needs to be treated right away and reported to the, uh, within 24 hours to your agency partner. Um, there's a variety of reasons for that, but it's important. Um, however, if you're doing a good job of uh, uh, preparing safely for your trip and working safely, hopefully you will never need to deal with that situation. So leading a crew is very important and I suspect a lot of you are trail crew leaders. Um, you know, it's important to uh, organize the trip ahead of time, uh, make sure that the participants understand what they need to bring with them. Um, be sure that once everyone is at the trailhead that you uh, go over the work that is uh, planned and then um, one of the things that often is is lost on leaders particularly new ones is that your job while you're out with particularly with a larger crew is so much it's not so much to do the work as it is to lead and that means you should um, roam back and forth along the area being worked to make sure that uh, the people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, praise good work, correct poor work promptly with positive attitude. And then the camaraderie of trail work is really important as well. Um, you need to make sure that everybody eats lunch together, um, make sure everybody's having fun, and uh, make sure, every, and one of the ways to do that is to make sure people do eat lunch and take their breaks and be sure to thank everybody really important. And then for organizations that um, are um, working under VSAs, typically there is a report that's required to the uh, agency partner. And so don't forget to turn in your trip report as needed. So the tailgate meeting is a uh, meeting that occurs at the trailhead before you go out and start the work. Um, already touched on some of these things. Um, it's important to go through a job hazard analysis discussion, uh, which would include uh, both what the um, potential hazards are of the work that you're going to be doing, 
as well as the potential hazards of the tools and how to properly carry them and um, how to do every aspect of the work that will be in process. Um, if you're in wilderness, the maintenance philosophy is really important so that people understand the scope of wilderness maintenance versus uh, regular trail maintenance. Um, all these things in, in some areas, some national forests uh, have very strict guidelines on how close to the trail you can work without uh, requiring NEPA compliance. So for instance, if you're gathering rocks and logs, you need to um, make sure that you have talked with your agency partners ahead of time and they know the bounds of the area you expect to be getting that material from and they can um, give that a blessing or not as, as appropriate. Um, again, make sure everybody has PPE, food and water. And then uh, new concerns that we're dealing with are things like you know how to deal with COVID-19, you know social distancing, uh, how to sanitize tools, how to um, uh, um, get to the work site appropriately and safely, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, a big concern. I know that uh, many of the groups that we work with that are both AT related and non AT related that do trail work are working very hard on coming up with recommendations as um, it appears more and more likely that uh, people will be getting back out on the trail soon. Um, go over the tools um, that are there, the hazards for each one. Um, here's a selection of tools that you might use. Uh, I, for some reason, I couldn't get my uh, my PowerPoint to capture my picture of my Pulaski, which is one of my favorites. But I'm curious to know, uh, again, perhaps in the chat, uh, what's your favorite maintenance tool? So Stephen, have there been any questions thus far? Not any questions in particular. Um, I'm pooling some of the cool trail resources y'all have mentioned so far. Um, some folks expressed um, some reasons for why they get out to just help future generations, help uh, improve uh, water quality. Now it looks like we're getting some good favorites. Uh, Jay, the man down in Georgia, loves some. Um, well, I guess he wants to see. Uh, he wants to see a McLeod uh, fire rigs for water bars. Stuart Hall, GATC, big boy handsaw. I'm a huge fan of that one myself. Uh, the fire rig and the Pulaski from Ron Ham uh, Hamlin. Yeah, you you bet. Great for digging in the dirt. Rogue Ho, another favorite of mine that I've just started to play around with a little bit more. And Kathleen is on my page. Shovel. Everything can be done with a shovel. Take a file to your shovel. Take care of your shovel. Amazing. Also, a, a silky katana boy. I treat that like a lightsaber it is. Great. Well, keep adding those as, as, as you will and uh, appreciate the input. It's uh, Trail work is a very personal thing and uh, everybody likes a different, different tool, I think. But i um, always interested to hear what people's favorites are. Mm-hmm. So uh, another question people often ask is, uh, you know, how and when do you do trail work? Um, again, it's different for every trail and it's even different for specific trails that, you know, cover a long distance. A uh, couple of local examples are the Appalachian Trail, uh, the Mountains to Sea Trail in North Carolina stretches from the beach up to the highest point in Tennessee. And um, so conditions are quite varied. Um, I was on a call yesterday with people with the main Appalachian Trail Club and Baxter State Park, and they still got two or three feet of snow on the ground in a lot of places along the trail in Maine. And they're not expecting um, that both because of COVID-19, but also because of snowpack, they don't expect Baxter State Park to be open until July this year. Um, so clearly they can't do maintenance right now. And uh, on the other hand, we've, we probably could have done maintenance almost all this winter down at this neck of the woods. But um, so the thing we recommend for the Appalachian Trail and might be applicable to other trails as well is that maintainers go out four times a year, um, go out in the 
late winter or early spring and clear blowdowns and clean out drainage structures. Then mid June and August, uh, cut come annual growth and repaint blazes. And then again in the late fall after leaf off, clean out drainage structures again to get them ready for uh, winter rain and winter snowfall. Um, those are just again basic maintenance items and there's lots of other things to do along trails during all those trips but those are the highlights. So um, again every trail is different in in terms of how it should be maintained. Uh, a trail like a um, greenway in a in a city park has a different style of maintenance than we do on wilderness trails. And so it's important to know what the desired condition of your trail is. Um, this is a, a statement about what the AT's desired condition is, but um, certainly every trail is different. And I'm curious to know, you don't have to say whether or not, um, you know, what specifically the desired condition of your trail is. But again, in the chat, if you would say, does your trail have a desired condition that you are aware of? That would be interesting um, to know. So um, again, uh, as part of that uh, desired condition, the desired appearance is pretty important. Um, again, this is for the Appalachian Trail, but you know, in the ideal situation, uh, we would like to have leaf litter remaining on the trail tread. It's a single. It's for single file use. Um, it is a trail, not a woods road. For many years, a lot of the Appalachian Trail was um, laid out for the sake of expediency along existing woods roads, but over the years we have been moving the AT off of those locations onto trail only. Um, want the trail side vegetation to be as natural appearing as possible. And of course, we want the tread to be stable. We don't want loose rocks or roots and uh, certainly want to minimize or eliminate erosion. Um, but again, does your trail have a, any kind of guidance on what you want the desired appearance to be, which can be a useful way for relating maintenance guidelines to some people. You know, everybody relates to things in various ways. And so sometimes a, the desired experience statement is a simple way to do that. Things to evaluate um, in terms of what's going on and what might what work you might need to do um, uh, as a particularly as a trail crew leader. Of course, you have to know where the problems are when you're taking the crew out, and so um, reports on erosion, widening, multiple treads, running water, et cetera, et cetera, are all important things. Um, collect that information, prioritize it, and then uh, work with your agency partners to. Um, figure out the plan for getting the work done. Some things that uh, we look for um, in terms of judging the condition are these about soil. As I said, my favorite one is just simply whether there's leaf litter remaining on the trail. Um, if you have leaf litter on the trail, you can you can typically feel comfortable that you have enough drainage on the trail to get the job done to keep the trail in good condition. So Morgan, just to chime in real quick, um, just because you kind of threw out a good question about desired conditions. We had some good um, folks kind of throw out that they absolutely have things that they have to pay attention to if they're making mountain biking trails or OHV trails or the difference in that. And uh, I know as um, volunteers and um, students on public lands who are doing service for other folks, we're always having to pay attention to exactly who we're doing thing, um, things for, whether it be making a sign or making a trail all the same. Um, right. Also, this is a great question um, that I really want to stop you on, Morgan, specifically are, there are a lot of trails in the Southeast in particular that are on old um, forest road beds and are by that design, because we've kind of, they haven't been designed, we kind of just shrugged off and kept going with it. Um, they're a lot wider than we want them to be. What are some good ways that we can try to minimize a lot of these um, road grades until the single track you're talking about, hiking single track? So again, I'll give you an example from the Appalachian Trail. Uh, we did a, a joint inventory with um, 
AT club volunteers, uh, staff from the local forest service districts and ATC staff to determine what the optimal location of the Appalachian Trail was and what land was needed to protect that optimal location. And through the process of that, one of the things was to, you know, examine whether the AT on an old woods road was in an appropriate place or not. You know, with the proviso that we wanted to avoid them where we could. Um, sometimes it's unavoidable. Um, sometimes the old woods road goes exactly where you want it to go and goes at in a sustainable fashion there. You know, it may be a well-designed woods road as opposed to, say, a skid road in an old timber sale, which is at a 35% grade and, and doesn't have any water bars on it or something. So not every woods road is created equal. Some of them, um, you know, are historic and you may want to use a, a, an old woods road simply because it's a historic route that is, provides some interesting color to, you know, what you're doing and allows you a chance to preserve a cultural resource. So there's a variety of reasons you might use a woods road, but because the AT in particular is, tr is predominantly trying to provide a semi-primitive non-motorized experience, we try and um, get away from them. So where you are using them, at least on the AT, what our proviso has been, is that the old woods road should be allowed to revegetate to as natural appearing a um, state as possible. And then the uh, AT is, you know, can follow it. And in the case of some really old ones, or uh, not necessarily woods roads, but old railroad grades and things like that, some of them are so so old and so well naturalized that the average hiker or backpacker may not realize that they're even on an old railroad grade or road. So, um, you know, there's a variety of, it's, it's a spectrum. And um, again, your desired condition, desired appearance, and type of trail you're using are all important determinants on to whether or not you're gonna use the old woods road. Um, so trail reports, again, this is, you know, not everybody does them, um, and there's lots of different ways to do them, but, uh, again, it's important to work with your agency partner to figure out what it is you're trying to accomplish, um, inventory the deficiencies that you've agreed to, and, um, figure out some way to make sure that, that you know where they are. Uh, Stuart Holt, who's on here from the GATC, has developed some great systems for with using capturing GPS data from photos that random hikers send in to tell where um, blowdowns are along the AT, or I guess other trails too. Um, so there's a variety of ways to do it, but again, assign them priorities and then agree on those priorities and uh, do your work planning. Again, work with your agency partner to figure out the plan and, and keep them posted on what you're up to. So um, this is not an all-encompassing list either, um, but these are the first five of the 10 basic maintenance tasks we've identified for the Appalachian Trail. And uh, of course, the most important thing uh, I think for any trail is to deal with the drainage. Um, the, uh, so that's the number one priority. Uh, make sure that all the drainage is in good shape and water is able to, to run through the drainage ditch and not on the trail. Um, cutting plant growth along the trail is really important so that the trail remains usable. Um, removing fallen trees. Uh, in the case of the Appalachian Trail, blazing is important to keep in good shape. Um, and as noted here, using only the minimal number needed. Uh, at times, uh, people become overzealous with the blazing and that ruins the, the primitive experience we're trying to provide. Um, and then, you know, signs are important on most trails and make sure they're in good shape. And then I'm going to go into some of the specifics on all these things following this. So separating water from the trail is really, really important. And as I noted here, it's, you know, it's important on interstate highways as well as the most primitive of footpaths. So on sloping 
the objective is to divert and slow the water. In other words, by diverting, you want to get the water off of the trail as rapidly as possible. And if you can't do that, to slow it down. On flat terrain, uh, it's sort of the opposite. I mean, you still want to drain the water, but that may not always be possible. So you may have to elevate the trail. Or as I'll mention in a few minutes, um, you may just want to look at uh, moving the trail. Um, if the trail is having drainage issues in flat terrain, perhaps there's a way to skirt around that so that you're not going through it. So the reason we want to slow the water down or get it off as fast as possible is because fast moving water is, is highly erodible. And so thick water, in other words, water that is deep, flows faster and carries more sediment with it and is more erosive than thin water. And this number three item is uh, just basic hydrology. And um, you can see that two mile per hour water along a trail carries 64 times more soil than one mile per hour water. I just think that's astounding. and um, and that is why we want to get water off the trail as rapidly as possible and um, either that or slow it down. So this is a crude example of thick water versus thin water. Uh, water running down a trail will be thick. Um, that's why the cupping is bad and that's why uh, the water diversion is so important. Um, sheet flow is really useful. It's hard to accomplish but um, that's why the, the slight outslope of a trail is important and why um, as you build new trail, compacting the trail tread and or cutting the berm off of old trail is important to try and establish that sheet flow so that the water never picks up any speed or an erosive ability. So um, Jeff Marion, points out that the most important influences on trail erosion are the density of drainage features. And we'll get to that in a second. Uh, the trail slope alignment angle, which is, you know, how close you are to fall line versus contour line. And then he has found in his research that graveling is very effective in uh, slowing erosion or preventing various trail problems. Many of us, um, use site-made gravel on a limited basis to deal with, with some of these issues, but um, at least on our primitive trails in wilderness, importing gravel is rarely, if ever, done. Um, and so that's not much of an issue for us in this discussion. So um, the Forest Service Manual uh, recommended, I'm not sure it still does, but uh, used to recommend that there needed to be some sort of water diversion device for every 10 feet of vertical rise along a trail. I've always found that to be a great rule of thumb. And so uh, if you think back to that uh, chart I showed that Jeff prepared about trail grade, you may have wondered why on a more gentle trail the, the uh, water diversions were further apart and that's simply the reason. So. The more gentle a trail is, the further apart the diversions can be, and vice versa, the steeper the trail is, the closer the water diversions need to be, and or other things to slow down the water. So what's the purpose of a water bar or grade dip? I think we, I hope we all know that, and that that's to get the water off the trail. It's really important. And uh, of course, grade dips or uh, reverse grades or Coweta dips, whatever you want to call them, are the best way to do that. And those are best installed um, when the trail is new as you're building it. But um, that isn't always possible. So that's why it remains a maintenance item and can, in some cases, be added. Um, everything we do on trail when we add new features need to be simple, safe, and solid. Um, that's really important that any structure we add, whether it's a water bar or a step, we'll get to steps in a minute, um, cribbing, uh, aka uh, retaining walls, 
Um, anything we do needs to be safe and solid. And the simpler it is, the better. That just makes it easier to maintain, easier to install. And um, this is something we try and keep in mind as we're building stuff along the Appalachian Trail. So here's the Coweta dip, named after the Coweta Hydrologic Experiment Station near Franklin, North Carolina, where they, I guess, invented it. I don't know if they invented it or just named it, but um, it's the reverse grade and um, works extremely well. The advantage of these are that you can build them in when the trail is, when you're constructing the trail, and if they're done properly, uh, I won't say they're maintenance free, but they generally are require less maintenance than a water bar does. But their main point is to get water off the trail. And so it's a, an undulation in the um, alignment of the trail. So water bar placements, uh, water bar is a, um, our rock or logs placed across the trail at about for a degree angle um, so that water is turned by that barrier to run off the edge of the trail. So the upper left-hand corner here is one that's along the trail. Um, for many years, the, stand, the rule of thumb was that the water bar should be at a 45 degree angle. Um, we have found over the years that that is too steep and um, or too abrupt is, is a better way of putting it. Whenever the water turns, it slows down. And in this case, we don't actually want water to slow down. We want it to keep moving because when it slows down, it will drop its sediment and then fill up the water bar, which will then get overtopped by the water and continue on down the trail, causing additional erosion. Um, lower left corner, uh, often it's, it's a good place to put a water bar, is at a switchback so that the water coming down the upper leg will continue straight ahead and uh, not lose any speed at all and go on off the trail. And then if you happen to use rocks, um, it's, uh, it's good to note that for anything you're sticking in the ground for trail work, you know, it should be like an iceberg. Most of it should be below ground so that it is as stable as possible. If you think about people walking down the trail with a heavy backpack on, <clears throat> if they come to a rock water bar, and step on it, um, their weight is, and momentum is going to push or try to push that top edge of the of the log or rock forward, and eventually that could work it loose. If you insert it in the ground two thirds to three quarters of the rock's length, um, which should be fairly considerable, it should be, you know, the water bar. To give you the scale here, the water bar is about six inches deep. Uh, so that means that what's in the ground is a foot to 18 inches uh, down below what you're looking at. But that will give the stability to make the, to the water bar last a long time, which is important. Stephen, do we have any questions yet? So we did have a question about blazing in particular that um, <clears throat> uh, Ron uh, just kind of piped up and started to handle in particular. And that was the question was pertaining to how far apart people should paint blazes. Um, really, we what we kind of mustered in the chat box is that, yeah, um, we really need to check the standards of the trail. Talking about the Appalachian Trail in particular, um, I believe, uh, actually, yeah, going to my handy dandy Appalachian Trail fee, uh, field book on page uh, 34, it goes between whether you're in more obscure areas or more regular areas, somewhere between 300 feet to 800 feet um, with a special consideration for wilderness in particular to not overblaze. Uh, Morgan, do you have any other thoughts on blazing in particular? Well, <clears throat> again, it depends upon where you are. For instance, in the Smokies, the Appalachian Trail, uh, as I said, is managed as wilderness and there the blazing is primarily at intersections. So after you have a, a blaze that you can see across the, the intersection and then another, what we call a safety blaze about 100 feet further, you may not run into another blaze until the next intersection you come to. Um, that would be a good wilderness standard in general. Um, what we try and do on the AT is have the blazes going northbound placed, say, maybe a thousand feet apart, and then the southbound ones the same distance but intervisible. So 
if you were to turn around and look over your shoulder after 500 feet from the last blaze, you would see one going the other direction. So you wouldn't have to wait so long for uh, reaffirmation that you're still on the AT. Yeah, as always, check where you are. I know there are tons of different cool styles. Uh, on the Teleco Ranger District, they do a kind of cut blaze that uh, I know Ken Jones made famous. Looks beautiful as it kind of scars the tree in a, in, a, in a good way that actually lasts for well over a decade. So, yeah, always check to see whatever the standard is. I, I do not know what the Mountains to Sea Trail standard is, but I know that it certainly varies on the section, um, not to slander. Yeah, I, I will also say that if, if there is blazing, it should be maintained and it should be maintained in a way that makes it crisp and clean so that it looks like it's been added by somebody as opposed to liking growing on a tree or something like that. So it's always important to to keep the, the blazes crisp and clear. If any are all in the big laurel section, that's the perfect example for how to do wilderness sections. Scotty has an artistic touch when he does that two inches by six <laughs> inches. <laughs> yeah, we had a uh, had a person in one of our clubs at one point who was so intent on making them crisp and clear that he would, I can't remember what he had. He had a, a fine brush of some sort with black paint and he would go around the edge of the blaze with black paint, which in fact really made it pop out. But um, that isn't part of our standard. <laughs> yeah. So here's a water bar and, um, you can see this is the old school suggestion of 45 degrees on the uh, graphic down here in the, in, the, in the V between the, the outflow ditch and the trail. But 30 degrees is much better. So replace in your mind that 45 degrees with 30 degrees, which means that the, the turn for the water is much more gradual. And um, you want a banked curve um, going into that water bar so that the, um, the speed of the water remains constant. It, it's not going to, but the, the closer to constant it remains, the better, and that will make it less likely to drop its sediment or other debris right there in the place that you're trying to um, keep clear. But that's another reason why it's important to keep the drainage clean because water bars will fill up unless you have lots of them. And of course, when they fill up, they don't function properly. Um, also, the uh, the outflow ditch should be um, about at least 12 inches wide. Uh, a lot of people that I have worked with like to use uh, fire rakes to clean water bars and so on. And so the ditch ought to be at least as wide as the tool you're using. And so a fire rake is probably about 12 inches, maybe a little bit more than that. So that's a good minimum width for that outflow ditch so that it's easily cleaned. And the other advantage of having a fairly wide ditch like that is that it is less likely to collect debris than a little narrow channel that might might be produced with just the blade of a, you know, the digging part of a Pulaski. The other thing about um, water bars, you can see that in this particular illustration, it looks more like a grade dip than a water bar. And that is because, again, over the years, we have changed our recommendations on how to build a water bar. Um, when I first started working for the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, um, the idea was that where that water is showing, the, the logs or rocks would be right there and the water would come down the trail, hit the water bar and, and you know, take a left or a right and go off the trail as appropriate. We found that, um, that was more prone to collecting um, sediment and also um, the, the turn was too abrupt. So the logs and rocks in current water bars that we're building are typically buried under the excavated dirt from the ditch and from the, um, from the trail so that they act more as the water bar structure is more of a reinforcement of the water bar than it is something that the water hits. If, it, if it's built correctly, the water never actually hits the logs or the rocks. They're there simply to reinforce the, the situation. 
So earlier I said that you can't always add grade dips, and this is, you know, um, this is my perspective. Not everyone would agree with this, but I would not add a grade dip to a section of trail that's over 10% grade. I think that the the walking in and walking out of that is too steep usually if you build it correctly. On the other hand, you can probably put a water bar effectively in a trail up to maybe 15 to 20% if you have to, because the construction of it is shallower than a grade dip typically, so that it doesn't create a sort of a slippery, unsafe entrance and exit for the hiker or the other user um, that a grade dip might on a steep grade. Hope that makes sense. But um, so I, you know, some people would say water bars are completely unnecessary in, in these times, but I would say that there are many places where they're still a valuable thing to use. So the other thing, Oh, hold on, Logan. Does anyone want to get a soap, get on their soapbox against water bars? I'm always just curious, you know. <laughs> I'm trying to pick a fight. Feel free to. Kevin, Beth, are you out there? Yeah, I'm. I'm quite happy for anybody to disagree with me on anything. <laughs> Um, we did get a question on managing flat water areas. I don't know if you're going to get to that um, shortly, but just... Yeah, it's coming up in a minute. Okay, cool. No spoilers. All right. Don't worry, David. <laughs> and so the, the final thing that we use uh, for drainage on slopes is uh, sometimes there are seep areas, um, uh, one or more seeps that come in along the top of the, from the uphill side of the trail. And so the objective there is to put a ditch on the uphill side to collect the water and then uh, route it off the trail either through a culvert or a water bar so that it gets off the trail as rapidly as possible. And ditches that we build along the trail, um, again, should be ideally at least 12 inches deep and 12 to 18 inches wide. Uh, they should be easily cleanable by a shovel at a minimum and, you know, by a water bar excuse me, a fire rake um, also. Um, and, and having them wide and deep like that um, makes that maintenance um, uh, period can be a little bit longer, which is good. Uh, but the other thing that happens when you make the ditch 12 inches deep, and I'll get to this in the flat part in a minute too, is that it actually lowers the water table below the, the surface of the tread. And by lowering the water table by a foot or so, you can significantly firm up the trail tread in those sort of uh, goopy areas where a, that a seep might otherwise create. And so that difference in elevation between the, the surface of the tread and the bottom of the ditch is important to help the trail solidify as you're draining the water. So we're continuing on slopes here. Um, anybody know what the purpose of a step is in trail work? You can type that into the chat and curious to hear what you say about that. Getting any answers, Stephen? Well, in a similar sentiment, um, well, I, well, I guess, yeah, to slow down water flow is the first thing that Jay DeMent said, but um, Jay said that he doesn't like water bars because they require more maintenance to create a small mountain requiring a big step over. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Water bars do require more maintenance, usually in case, unless they're really well made. Um, yes, and I also agree that the purpose of a step is not the convenience of the hiker. Um, it is not to make the trail easier to walk. It is to slow down water. And again, they need to be simple, safe, and solid. So what happens when the water runs down a step? So let's say the water's coming. Can everybody see my cursor here? Does that uh, show up? 
barely sure. depending on the size of people's screens, but yeah. Okay, well, if the water is coming downhill from above um, and runs over a step, you can, you can see from this picture that in the eye, in the proper step construction, the backfill of the lower step should be pretty darn close to level between the two steps. And leveling that out, that slows the water down. And slowing the water down will make it drop sediment there. And that's actually a place on the trail where you would like it to drop sediment is behind the step because that actually helps to maintain the trail. Um, so the purpose of log steps or rock steps is to slow down water. That's the primary purpose. Um, log steps, uh, depending upon what wood you're using, you can use whole logs like shows in this picture. If you're using my favorite black locust that's seasoned, then um, you know you can use um, logs that are split in half to make it go a lot further. Um, the stakes, you know, one of the big mistakes that is often made on um, building steps is that the stakes are not long enough. They have to go in the ground far enough, again, so that they're resisting a lot of lateral pressure from people coming down the trail and hitting the top of the step and pushing against the, pushing against the stake. You can see if you're out on the trail that when steps fail, it's often because the stake uh, was too short or the stake rotted out and the and the step gave way. Um, another point that isn't illustrated in this particular um, illustration but is very useful uh, is to actually bury the bottom step completely. And the reason for that is that often it is very difficult to start a flight of steps, even if it's just two or three, like as illustrated here, at the very bottom of a slope. You know, there's lots of places on trails where the um, slope is steeper than the, the grade is more than is desirable, but some sections of that grade may be a little bit less and, you know, don't really need steps to, to slow the water and stop the erosion. It's just, it, you know, a lot of slopes uh, starting, let's say, at a gap and going up a hill are kind of a curvilinear grade. They, they start slowly and, and the grade starts from zero and increases to whatever the maximum grade of the trail is there. And so it's difficult to figure out sometimes where to start that flight of steps and make it ef efficient so that you're not just building hundreds of steps to start at the bottom of the slope. The, the rule of thumb is you should always start your flight of steps at the bottom. And uh, so the question is, where's the bottom? Anyway, one way to help deal with that is you bury the bottom step completely. And that way, if you didn't get the answer to that question correct, over time, as erosion occurs, that bottom step will slowly get exposed, but will continue to function in the way it's supposed to, and it will, it will stave off for a much longer period of time before you need to come back and do something to that flight of steps. Hope that makes sense. It's a little bit, a little bit awkward to explain. <laughs> so Morgan, um, really quickly, I just wanted to hop in with a couple quick questions. Um, one, um, we had a question of, could you install a wood step at a 30 degree angle rather than a water bar kind of, is kind of somewhere in between kind of thing? Um, no, <laughs> I, I would say that trying to make a combination out of a water bar and step is a bad idea. Um, there are places where we instead install a water bar and then uh, actually on the outside edge of the trail have this, a step below it that touches the water bar so that it um, reinforces the water bar, uh, keeps it from being undercut, and also provides a step to get up to the water bar, if that makes sense. Yeah, I know that's certainly Rocky Top's uh, main go-to in a lot of the deep back country corners of the Smokies. Right. Um, Ron Hammond wants to know what's the maximum step height um, th that you would go for. 
Well, it, it does vary, but for instance, this set of steps illustrated here, that's, you know, just sort of, in, you can't tell where it is, but I will say it's in open woods. If you make it more than about six inches per step, people are just gonna walk around it. Um, on the other hand, uh, in areas of really rocky, steep terrain, like the Appalachian Trail and the White Mountains, some of the steps that the Appalachian Mountain Club has installed there are knee high or even thigh high. You have to sometimes turn around and sit down on the step and pull your feet up to get up the thing. And people don't go around it because that's a less, you know, a less altitude to go up than the surrounding rocks, or perhaps there's a sheer uh, ledge that they can't otherwise get up. So there are times when bigger is okay, but it's pretty darn rare. In the Southern Appalachians, generally speaking, it should be just like a staircase in the house. Maximum of eight inches, six inches is better. Sounds good. And uh, going back a couple slides, just um, so you mentioned your favorite black locusts, putting those in the ground. If you don't have black locusts, what are some other woods that you would use? And what are some other woods that people might be using that they should really not bother with? Well, um, woods that are rock highly resistant rock resistant around. around here. Black locust is best. Um, King. Uh, next would probably, the, that are commonly available, next best would probably be white oak, either white oak or chestnut oak. Um, black walnut's pretty rot resistant, not terribly common, but um, uh, sassafras is rot resistant. Um, ones I wouldn't use are just softwoods, you know, pine, um, maples are, don't last long. Uh, some woods like uh, birch, you know, and when you use them for woodworking are great hard woods, but they are not rot resistant in the, in the ground. Um, so, yeah, the best ones would probably, the best commonly available ones are probably locust and the, the two white oaks that are around here. Now, if you find yourself in an area with some bald cypress, you know, way off the Appalachian Trail or something, you know, in some swamp wood, go nuts. Right. Well, Osage orange is really rot resistant. Catalpa is really rot resistant, but I don't see much of that out on the AT. Um, anyway. So here's another log step illustration. Um, it shows that red line is, is what the uh, backfill should look like when a, in a completed step. Um, it should be virtually flat. It should have a teeny bit of downslope toward the lower step. More importantly though is if you look at this, look at the bottom step and see where the top of it is, and then look at the upper step and see where the bottom of it is. And if you look, you will see that the bottom of the upper step is below the top of the lower step. And what that achieves, if you put that in uh, that way, is that keeps the, um, it doesn't allow you the erosion to undercut the upper step at all. Um, so if you install steps like this, and it doesn't require much, but an inch or so of difference, you know, an in, inch or so that that top step is below the top of the bottom one, you should never have the, backfill wash out um, at least going down slope you know it, you may have problems with it washing out the edge uh, the side of the downhill side of the trail but you won't have it washing out over the front of the steps again i hope that makes sense but um and in this illustration those uh, the stakes that are shown are pretty typical of the length of inexperienced step builders they're way too short. They've got to be a lot longer than that. If you happen to have a curved log, you can use it. Um, uh, see my red note down there? Anybody know what's wrong with this graphic? Quick answer in the chat. And the reason um, you want the bow down 
uh, water flowing over the middle of the step is the most erosion resistant place for the water to go. You don't want the water to run around either end. That will defeat the purpose of the step. Yes, we got some space below the log undermining too shallow water gets under the log. Exactly. So yeah, this this log should have been placed so that the bottom of the log was below the tread level. We don't want we don't want that gap. Even even though you could fill that behind with coarse rock or gravel, uh, that's not a good plan. Real quick, uh, um, Katie or Eric to put you on the spot, or David if y'all want. I don't know if any of you guys want to um, handle this quick question on using treated lumber. Or Morgan, um, the question in the chat is, are there any rules against using treated lumber in wilderness areas? I certainly have an opinion myself, but if anyone... Or Morgan, how do you feel about that? I think John ought to answer that. And John Campbell on? Um, hey, step away for a moment. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I'm back after uh, dealing with uh, a wasp sting uh, in my household. So, um, so there are no particular rules that prevent that. But as you analyze a project in some way, you want it to look as natural as possible. Um, I, I think that's the rule of thumb. I, you know, if it's something that's going in the ground like this it's going to be less of an impact over time. You know, when you start talking about structures and other things, it gets different uh, as you do the analysis of alternatives for what you're putting in, but uh, nothing that prevents it, uh, no rules against it, but uh, obviously we want to use natural materials when possible. Yeah, I, I would avoid it as much as I possibly could. And yeah, I'm, um, so we, uh, to my best knowledge, we don't do it all that much in the, um, our footprint, but I know around McAfee's Knob, because of how much um, impact it got, they used a lot of landscaping timbers in steps when going up to it, and I know that they do get some feedback that it just kind of looks a little just, yeah, less natural th than it could, yeah, so. Yeah, but that's, that's not wilderness either, though, right? No, but even there in an area that get like where you where it would be the most acceptable to see kind of that area, non wilderness gets a lot of footsteps. It's still kind of uh, meh for a couple miles in the backcountry. Well, there's other yeah. stuff that could have been used. Yeah, I, I don't like it. We've had you know places along the trail where people have experimented using the plasticized wood products and that kind of stuff, and I think the general consensus is it's last resort. That's what I was going to say. It's uh, it's just going to depend on the situation. If all else has failed and natural materials uh, can't do the job, um, yeah, there's nothing to say you couldn't use those other materials. So um, we don't use check dams on the Appalachian Trail. Um, we use them on sections of trail that we have abandoned to stop erosion but the difference between a check dam and a step is that a check dam doesn't have any um, constructor provided backfill and the at gets enough use so that if there's a puddle behind a step people are going to walk around it so um, we just say if you, if you need a step there backfill it we don't call it a check dam because the check dams don't have backfill but that is a very common, just, uh, I mean, I appreciate Morgan being clear on that because, yeah, that's a very common, people use the term check dam for steps all the time. I know out west, that's just kind of their interchange um, for groups that I worked on. But. Yeah. But the most important thing in this slide is the, the two distances. So um, in between the stakes, it needs to be at least 18 inches and uh, at least six inches in from either end. Um, it is okay to place the stakes inside the, the or outside of the trail tread and in the in the dirt. If you have a cut bank, if you're if you're putting steps into a ditch, you may not even need the stakes if there's a good solid, you know, earth chunk of earth on either side of them. Um, and then the other other um, important thing is that the steps need to be driven below the top of the um, the log so that people's pant cuffs don't catch on them as they're walking down the hill. 
So this, uh, you know, I'm, I had assumed this was more or less a basic maintenance class, and I'm not going to go a whole lot into the rock steps, but generally there are three kinds of rock steps that we put in on, along the Appalachian Trail. This is what we call rock on rock. Uh, they should have a slight back tilt so that people don't slide off the front as they're coming downhill. They should be uh, significant rocks. We, we say they need to be at least two person rocks and, and which means at least two people are needed to pick them up and ideally it might even be three people or four people to, to move one of these rocks because we want them to stay put once they've been put in place. In the rock and on rock there is uh, nothing between the rocks so the rock selection is really important and um, it is uh, completely inappropriate to put any shims in from the front to keep the the rocks from uh, moving around when you step on them. It is okay to put shims in from the back where they can't work out, but from the front, don't shim a step. Um, we call these rock and earth steps with, uh, if you happen to have a nice slab, slab rock or something that you can make steps out of. Again, note that, you know, at least two thirds of the rock is in the ground to prevent that uh, the, the rock from working loose from the downward pressure of people walking downhill on uh, six to eight inch rise and they should tilt back slightly um, to also help with the uh, prevention of being pushed forward and always have tamped mineral soil or gravel as the backfill and of course gravel is always better if you have the wherewithal to make on-site gravel. And then these tuck behind steps um, this is, these were invented by um, the main Appalachian Trail Club uh, to make some of their extensive rock step work that they are involved in a little bit more expedient. The rocks have one flat surface and that is the, you know, the up that people will walk on, the tread surface. But the the thing that they discovered about using this type of rock step construction in addition to um, being able to use irregular rocks was also that they could, unlike what I said before, they could actually start in the middle of a, of a flight of steps or someplace else and make it work um, if they had to. It's always better to start from the bottom, but tuck behind steps give you a little bit more um, flexibility than the other types. So flat terrain, um, drain the water or elevate the trail, or as I noted earlier, avoid the flat area if that's feasible. So things you're probably um, familiar with are causeways and turnpikes, which are very similar, except that causeways don't have the outside ditches. In both cases, they're lined along the sides with rocks or logs, uh, rot resistant logs, and then backfilled in a variety of ways. In this illustration, the backfill starts with um, crushed rock and grades down to mineral soil on the top. Um, the width of the area, this shows 18 to 24 inches and 36 inches. It really depends upon the, the user. Um, I would say that for a hiking only trail, that the distance between the, uh, uh, the rocks or logs could be as little as 12 inches. And as you can imagine, that would significantly reduce the amount of work needed to install one of these, um, exponentially reduce it. And so um, it's really easy, as I said before, to get carried away and, and make things complicated. Uh, one thing to simplify is not to make things bigger than you actually need. So the 36 inch width that's shown for the turnpike is much more appropriate, say, for a horse trail than it is for a hiking trail. So the, the um, problem with these is that it may block the, the flow of water through the boggy area and uh, in some cases you may not be able to get NEPA compliance approval for that because it's changing the hydrology of the area. Something we use along the AT quite a bit, particularly in the 
northeast where the trail is pretty mucky is uh, log bog bridges or sometimes called punching. Um, they have the advantage of allowing a cross flow of water. Their main disadvantage is particularly up there when you're using native materials is that the native materials don't last very long so they have to keep replacing them every 10 years or so and uh, it's quite an undertaking because in some cases they're they go on for hundreds of feet at a time but they work nicely when they're installed properly um, cutting plant growth is uh, you know one of those first five things on the on the basic maintenance thing um, so four by eight clearance is for a typical clearance for a hiking trail. That doesn't mean you should walk through with a, with a uh, sheet of plywood and be able to walk along. It's a general clearing limit, but um, it's important to get it that high because, you know, some people are taller or have taller packs than others. And when um, the branches are wet, they will sag down, uh, particularly in places like rhododendron tunnels. Uh, during snowfall, it may fall, it, it, they may sag down so far that it nearly becomes impassable. Uh, on a horse trail, um, we generally uh, recommend four feet by 10 feet high. And um, I'm not actually sure what the clearance is suggested for a mountain biking trail, but, uh, or an ATV trail, but I suspect that it might be um, about the same as a, as a horse trail. Um, the important thing is, to not have any stobs. So stobs are cut off branches that are not cut off flush with a trunk and stick out a little bit. And that's important because um, people can um, catch on those and, and or even catch an eye or, or if they're down near the ground can fall on them and get stabbed by them and they're just dangerous. And they're also bad for the, the trees or the bushes. It's much better to trim the limbs back flush with the trunk of the tree or back to the next big branch that you're you have to get them out of the way. So no stops, please. Um, mostly the clearing should occur on the uphill side of the trail, on the cut bank. Um, certainly branches from, from saplings and bushes and things that extend over the trail on the downhill side should be cleared, but you should not clear the downslope from the trail um, because uh, we're actually trying to use that vegetation to push people back to the inside of the trail. The strongest part of the trail is at that hinge point between the tread and the upper uphill cut bank. And so we would like people to walk as close to that as possible, not on the outside edge of the trail. And then the other place to cut vegetation um, would be in retaining walls, uh, either above or below the trail. The uh, particularly little saplings as they grow can force the walls apart and destroy them. Uh, another thing we use in, um, I guess a little bit out of order, sorry about that. Uh, another place for, uh, another solution for flat areas is stepping stones. Um, these, like other rocks that you put in, are like icebergs. You just seen the tip of the of the stone above the water. Uh, they, they should be buried so that they do not move when you jump up and down on them. And then the last six items of our basic maintenance list, pick up and pack out litter, break up illegal fire rings, um, eliminate shortcuts and walk arounds, remove loose rocks and trails for, or rocks and roots from the trail treadway, and clean out drinking water sources. So um, we have found over the years that uh, cutting significant roots, like over a couple inches in diameter on live trees is really bad for them. Some species, for instance, uh, black birch that occur at higher elevations, I don't know what, what happens, but they really dislike that and will die very quickly if you cut their big roots. Whereas other trees like a red maple, you could probably cut all but one root and it wouldn't phase the tree in the least. But Anyway, it's better not to cut big tree, uh, big roots and uh, install gravel above and uh, perhaps um, a step below to protect them as opposed to removing them. And then a brief comments here about campsite maintenance. Um, 
uh, our new paradigm, again, this is based upon Jeff Marion's research. Um, we have started building no new campsites that are on flat places near water. Anything we build now, if we build any, are side hill campsites. Um, even, even new shelters, if we build one along the AT now, we're trying to build those in um, excavated flat places on the side of a hill. And, uh, but in terms of maintenance, we want to check for drainage. It's very important on a, on a tent pad to make sure that it's well drained and that it is comfortable. And by comfortable, I mean that there shouldn't be any rocks poking up and so on. So they require constant maintenance and observation as well to make sure that they're in good shape. Um, some campsites that are still in flat areas, uh, the best way to try to prevent high, uh, spread by user created new campsites is to delineate the campsites. Um, if you have any blowdowns in the area, you might put some, uh, some of the logs along the edges of the campsite, which serve two purposes. One is to delineate it and also gives a place for people to sit and, and cook or rest or whatever. And then um, want to watch for campsite expansion. Um, uh, if you find that people are creating new sites, you need to obliterate those and make sure that there's any fire rings that are there are removed and there's only one fire ring remaining in the area where you want the uh, camping to occur. And then solid structures. In this illustration, there's a, a uh, AT shelter and a um, camp a tent pad with a log cribbing. And you know those are gonna require observation and maintenance over time. It may be that the, even though those are locust crib logs, eventually they're gonna rot out. And of course the shelter needs to be kept in good shape in terms of the roofing and, and the foundations and so on. And so finally, if you find a, a place that is even your real problems and you can't figure out how to deal with it using normal maintenance, maybe it should be relocated. Um, but that isn't always the case. So, um, you know, if, if all the normal things that you, you would apply to that kind of situation aren't working, then it, think about it. But if the new route's going to cross the same kind of terrain using a similar grade and construction techniques, or if the old trail can't be closed, or if the new route will not provide an obvious improvement, then just keep maintaining what you've got. The relocation will just do the same thing over. It may take a little while, but eventually it'll end up the same way as the old one. So, further questions? That's all I've got. All right. Well, um, just now, Eric Giebelstein just uh, asked, what's the campsite and shelter maintenance and construction and wilderness intersection look like? <laughs> I'm, I might have a thought or two about that. Are we talking about AT shelters? I don't think there's too many in the Southern <clears throat> Appalachians other than AT shelters in wilderness. Um, so, in in currently or previously designated wilderness areas that have been uh, that have included the Appalachian Trail, there is report language in all of the bills in Georgia and North Carolina, Tennessee, and I'm pretty sure in Virginia, Eric, but you'd have to double check that for me, that allows AT shelters to remain and to uh, be maintained. Um, forest plans, on the other hand, have some additional language that suggests that if something happens to an AT shelter in wilderness, there should be due consideration of moving the, the replacement shelter, if there is one, outside of the wilderness area. Um, I'm not sure that covers what you were talking about, but um, I know that you have dealt with some of those issues in Virginia. And I know what um, this is starting to look like for the future in Georgia is that as we are zoning, um, the trail in particular and the zone sections for exactly how we see the areas with, um, you know, brief synopsis that zone number one being wilderness is zone number five being a lot more developed and trying to figure out what the desired conditions for each one of those zones and everything in between. We're looking to see where should more designated campsites or where we should create more campsites or where those should be offered and we are looking for those opportunities outside of wilderness. So 
um, that is starting to give us some justification to um, provide better opportunities for folks rather than the same old mediocre disper dispersed campsites that we see a lot directly on top of and along the Appalachian Trail. Yeah, I, I, I've worked at ATC for a long time and have helped build a number of Appalachian Trail shelters, um, some of which have been in wilderness and certainly have helped repair some AT shelters in wilderness and have gone from being an advocate for Appalachian Trail shelters to a minority opinion, an opinion perhaps of only one, <laughs> but I just soon get rid of all the AT shelters. They have become attractive nuisances, for instance, but that's not happening. <laughs>